Let us join in the call to worship. If this is not a place where tears are understood, where can I go and cry? If this is not a place where my spirit can take wing, where can I go and cry? If this is not a place where my questions can be asked, where can I go and If this is not a place where my heart cries, can be heard. Where shall I go to speak? If this is not a place where tears are understood, where shall I go? Where shall I go? It is good. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. To be in the house of the Lord. One more time. One more time. Our opening hymn, Lord, listen to your children pray. In the faith we sing, 2193. <clears throat> Let us stay in the worship. <clears throat> Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, for I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. In your arms, O God, we find rest. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. 
invite anyone who has a joy or a concern to lift those up before the congregation in God at this time. Ms. Dorothy. It is a joy to see you. I'm sorry with you. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Rhonda sn snuck in under the um, under the uh, under the music. Ron. Uh, Ron is here. Oh, Ron is here. Yes. Oh. Hi, <laughs> Roland. I have a joy that uh, democracy seems to be working in this country. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we are people of hope. Speaking of the justice system. Oh, okay. I'm talking about current events. <laughs> Ronan's being um, optimistic with changes taking place in our country. Good. We can all be in prayer and joyful and thankful for that. I have a concern. I don't know how many of you keep up with what's going on in the general church, but I read this week that the Council of Bishops of the United Methodist Church are meeting this week to discuss the future of the United Methodist Church. Uh, we need to be praying for our bishops. Many of the, a number of our bishops are retired early. I read where one of them said that the pressure of being a bishop, the joy of being a bishop, has left him. And he didn't have the spirit to continue. I understand that. I also have read where the uh, Global Methodist Church, the new church that's breaking away, some of their members are asking the other Methodist churches that are staying to stop giving your money to the United Methodist Church. The spirit of the vision, the spirit that is unchristian. We need to be praying. Let's pray for our bishops this week and continue to pray for them as they try to bring us together and allow the goodness that we have experienced grow in our lives and in the church as we birth a new United Methodist Church, even with the pains of birth. It's going to be joy. Let us stay together. Thank you, Dean. We'll be in prayer for the bishop and um, all people connected to the United Methodist Church during these um, during the turmoil of the division. Bill. Uh, so the joy is that uh, Mike Passano, who is our old-time member, a very, very substantial lawyer, has done work on our prison. Thank you, Bill. Mike Passano is an incredible human being. So much, so much depth has served his entire adult life advocating for death row prisoners. Um, last line of defense, a federal public defender, and he has just put done a, a miraculous job with Mike's case. <coughs> Dick, great yeah. to see you back. 
כך נעים שם, רואים פה ברצקע, בשל של היום בקובי. כן, ולראות כפו די איזה. ‫אולי Dick was uh, laid up with COVID for 10 days or so, and with his underlying health conditions, this was a serious concern, but he's, he's a, a tough old bird. <laughs> Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, God of all nations, thank you for hearing our prayers and our joys. Guide us forward as your beloved children. You love justice and hate oppression. You give peace to those who seek it. You condemn violence, wherever it is in your creation. Surround us with a great cloud of witnesses that we may have faith to live by your word in our time, in this day, and have the courage and endurance to persevere and continue as we face our own trials and struggles. Give us courage to follow your servants and prophets. Empower us to be the body of Christ, embodying Jesus' teachings for our day, our time, and use each of us as a blessing and a channel of love to those who need it most. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you are able in from the hymnal number 463, Lord, speak to me.
I believe in love even when I don't feel it. And I believe in God even when God is silent. This is I believe. <clears throat> Kevin, we are so grateful for you being here. And so um, in awe of the, the, the talent in our choir, small but mighty, mm -hmm. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Today, we're back on the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. Um, no, chapter 13. That's okay. I'll start it after the, after the story. 
Luke chapter 13, verses 10 to 17. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox and his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame. And the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. It's important that we never forget Jesus was very much a faithful Jew throughout his ministries. Start to finish, Jesus was Jewish. Think about it. Jesus was presented at the temple as an infant. His opening sermon proclaiming his public ministry was in a synagogue. In today's story, he's again teaching in a synagogue. And in this case, he's debating with other Jewish leaders about the meaning of keeping the Sabbath. He doesn't get any more Jewish than that. <laughs> However, for many of the Jewish leaders, Jesus had this annoying habit of healing people on the Sabbath. And when he was criticized for it, in chapter 6, he responds with a sarcastic question. Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save a life or to destroy it? And in chapter 14, he responds by asking whether it's lawful to help a child who's fallen into a well on the Sabbath. Today's reading is part of that larger pattern. So let's look at it. The leader of the synagogue's argument in today's reading seems logical, reasonable to me. He says, keeping the Sabbath is an important commandment. The Sabbath is a day of rest, not work. Deuteronomy tells us clearly that on the seventh day you shall not work. I love you, man, but it's pretty clear if you're going to heal this woman, you have to do it on the six other days of the week. After all, she's been in this condition for 18 years. What's another day going to matter? So first pass, I'm saying, well, that's kind of logical. He's a smart man. But Jesus argues back. You're missing the whole point. Don't you untie your ox and your donkey on the Sabbath day? How much more should you unbind this long-suffering daughter of Sarah and Abraham so she might be set free from her suffering? It's been 18 years for the love of God. Or you may have said, for the love of Dad. Or Mom. Not one more day does she need to suffer. There's not a better day all week, any day, not a better day than the Sabbath. Because it's a day of liberation, the day we remember that we too were freed from bondage in Egypt and God has set us free. Jesus was passionate and he was convincing. See, the Hebrew Bible gives us two commandments to keep the Sabbath. One was to remember that God sent liberation of the people coming out of Egypt. The other was in the imitation of God on the seventh day of creation to take the time where God took the time to rest and delight in the sheer goodness of it all. 
For us, keeping the Sabbath frees us from the weekly grind to reinforce what's most important in our lives, our relationships with God, family, community, <coughs> even with ourselves and creation. It's also reminding us of the divine freedom at the center of our lives, and even in a larger, more cosmic sense, keeping the Sabbath provides us with a glimpse of the promised land. It moves us toward the kingdom of God. The Sabbath is a gift given to help us thrive, personally and communally. And its spirit embraces God's entire neighborhood, including other species, the ox, donkey, livestock. In short, Sabbath keeping is for the restoration of creation, for experiencing and cultivating the deep abiding goodness in God and the world that God has made. This is huge, but it's underappreciated. Our culture is so intense, it's so hectic, it's so fast paced. People don't take the time to embrace and enjoy the gift the Sabbath. But it's critical to our faith journey because the Sabbath day is part of a much larger rhythm in our spiritual journey. Every seventh day is a Sabbath. Every seventh year is a Sabbath year. And every seventh Sabbath year is a Jubilee year. A Jubilee year is kind of a Sabbath at the land rests, enslaved people are freed, and debts are canceled. This 50-year rhythm finally leads us to what Jesus proclaimed as the year of the Lord's favor. He evokes this beautiful jubilee tradition in framing the inbreaking of the kingdom of God where all creation is set free. And we get to participate. So the message that we need to hear in today's reading is that Jesus was a rabbi and, importantly, a reformer, a religious reformer. He was especially concerned about protecting religious life being misused or distorted. Since the very beginning, too many people believe that if they mastered religious practices, memorized religious law and scripture, they were finished with their spiritual journey. They were righteous. They were holy. They were saved. But that's not really how it works. Jesus consistently teaches that regardless of how beautiful our practices and our rituals are, they're never meant to be the goal of our faith. They should never be the end result of our journey. That would be idolatry. Our faith is meant to be vibrant, alive, and always growing and always changing with the purpose of helping to usher in the kingdom of God so all creation can flourish. Jesus teaches again and again that the purpose of all practices and laws like Sabbath keeping is to help foster healthy, vibrant forms of life and relationships. And any religious act that diminishes life is doing harm. And it's more than a missed opportunity to do good. It's a profound and disastrous reversal of what God intended, a reversal of our divine purpose. As this passionate reformer, Jesus called out any religious practice that on the surface may well appear to be holy, but underneath has become the complete opposite. Just like withholding food from the hungry, or like a poison that's being used as medicine, it's sin masked as holiness. That's why Jesus repeatedly healed on the Sabbath. He wanted to provoke these teachable moments. 
with religious leaders that he cared about. Religious leaders he needed to understand and release their tight grasp on the law and begin to understand what Sabbath keeping really means. Things are no different today. Jesus the Jew protecting important Jewish practices should remind us to identify distortions in our Christian practices. At its heart, Luke's story today is about how the most holy of duties can be carried out in ways that distort and subvert mm -hmm. what God wants. Mm -hmm. Not just Sabbath keeping, but every religious practice is vulnerable to this type of distortion. And I'm pretty sure that we Christians commit it at least as often as everyone else. Mm -hmm. And people are fleeing from the church because of these negative manuscripts manifestations of Christian theology. Every disciple and every church seeking to follow Jesus should always be ask, asking questions like, are we practicing our faith in the proper spirit? Are we oriented toward the God of love in all we do, in our worship, in our service, in our prayers? Are all of our actions focused on the vibrant health of the beloved community? Obviously, the answer is no, at least in the big picture in this country. I truly want to love the communities of faith that have embraced self-serving theology and practices, those that are doing harm. I want to pray for them. I want to remind them and us how seductive and easy it can be to begin embracing distorted and self-serving understandings of Jesus' teachings. Christian nationalism is an extreme example of this common problem. For example, Hobby Lobby this week took out a full-page ad in the paper saying that only Christians should be involved in running our country. Oh and my gosh. Connecting Christ's teaching to power is the exact opposite. That's upside down of what Jesus taught. The thing is, our job is to focus on the good news of God's universal love for all people and our call to continue to be that love here in the Ed Shield neighborhood. To follow Christ's teachings through our continued focus on the most vulnerable in our community. In restoring opportunities right here in this beautiful neighborhood. The good news is Jesus is always in favor of justice and action. He stands against Christianity's self-righteousness in their many forms. And he's calling us to reclaim the beauty and promise of Sabbath keeping and religious practices in general. He was a passionate advocate and reformer of broken religious practices who spent his life clarifying the proper purpose, character, and life-giving spirit precisely so we might be able to discover it, them, for ourselves in this present moment. For the Sabbath was made to help unbind us and to set us free. Amen. I now invite you to stand as you are able, and we're going to sing from the faith we sing, the hymn is Grace Alone. And in that hymn, wherever it uses the word His, we want to change that to God when we sing it. Grace Alone, 2162, in the faith we sing.
How many of you have ever heard that song before? But the words reminded me of a song you do know. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. In the spirit of grace and in the spirit of love, let us receive our gifts for God this morning. Will the ushers come yeah, I'd like to ask everybody to put their mask back on while we're together here. Thank you. Did you really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 Ye